Hello, my name is Jacek Bartosiak. Uh, uh, this is Strategy and Future. And with me is Albert Świdziński. Uh, hi, Jacek. Hi, Albert. Hi, how are you? Okay, so we ha we're having another episode of our new uh, series titled uh, Geopolitical Insight by Strategy and Future. Uh, last time we discussed the uh, structural uh, tensions between the United States and China, the strategic plan or lack of it. That was a uh, you know open question that we were trying to to answer. Now, today we will be talking about the um, the war in Ukraine uh, per se, but it's not only about the the warfare, the conduct of war. Uh, we will try to define uh, the geopolitical framework that is uh, related uh, and heavily leaning on the conduct and outcome of the war. We'll talk about uh, escalation control, about the role of the United States, about uh, the Russian plans, consolidation of the Euro Eurasian supercontinent, uh, role of the China, and of course, we'll try to touch a little bit uh, about the intermarium concept and Poland, and hybrid warfare that is probably upon uh, the region. Uh, so we will try to depict this war from a broad strategy, grand strategy and uh, geopolitical uh, analysis perspective, which is not uh, an often a frequent analysis uh, uh, on YouTube and uh, on YouTube and internet as we have uh, checked. So I hope you will sort of enjoy it. You will find it useful and interesting. And Albert, let me start by sort of uh, framing the following thesis. So first of all, the war in Ukraine is a system transforming war. Still, it is a limited war. And I'd like to ask you what struck you the most? What was the most striking phenomenon related to the war? And I will share first my perspective, what was most striking for me. The most striking was how limited this war is, despite the fact that this is a system transforming war in the era of thermonuclear uh, weaponry. This is a war between United States and Russia in a way that the United States is trying by proxy to contain Russian behavior in a limited way, containing horizontally and vertically in order not to you know expand this war to nuclear exchange or nato uh, nato sort of um, uh, entering the, the war with russia and not only that and i will end here the uh, the most interesting factor is that there are actually two fronts of this war one front is warfare supplies delivery of weapons and ammunition, of course, the evolution of the battlefield, bravery of soldiers, Kiev, Kherson, Kharkov, you know, Zaporozhye, Mariupol, all those things that you, you can see on, 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 on internet. But another front, which is highly sophisticated, is strategic messaging and framing the behavior of both Russia and the United States to keep the confrontation as a limited war and persuading another party, especially persuading by the United States upon the Russians, not to escalate into another level, even if they are losing and when they are losing, which is a mass strategic masterpiece. You know what I mean, Albert, yeah? And that is, that is a very teaching lesson, very teaching lesson for strategists across the world how you frame that war is much more than just a war itself, you know, tactical engagements and kinetic exchanges of fire. It's a political dance with many subtle notes that you you have to, to make. Uh, Albert, go ahead. Yeah, the, I mean, you touched upon so many things that, you know, we could spend the next three hours focusing just on half of the of the uh, issues you, you raised. Look, I would start with saying, uh, uh, which what I think you mentioned, this was a system, potentially system shattering war, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, because with the amount of norms and laws that Russia broke, and Russia being such a <clears throat> prominent part of the international system at the end of the day, one that wasn't happy with, with this position, one that was revisionist, but nonetheless, a very prominent uh, member of the international community. If you have a 
such a uh, prominent member uh, breaking with all the norms, the entire system is in jeopardy, right? Especially that if you remember the Lavrov ultimatum from 2021, it extended far beyond Ukraine. It, it essentially wanted to uh, recreate security architecture in Europe in a way that if the at least most or some of uh, you know issues raised by the Russians would be met would essentially mean that there is no place for the U.S. presence in Europe anymore, right? It would. Uh, uh, Europe, United States, stop stops being a European power. So to speak. Yeah, it's 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 basically out of the equation. Uh, you know, in, in, in formal terms, it would still be there, but it would uh, it would you know the the idea that it's a security provider in Europe or a or a defining force in Europe would be corrupt would be would be broke especially after uh, Afghanistan right and uh, withdraw from from Afghanistan so we remember that so that's the first thing to notice the other thing as you said is how how the US found itself confronting a problem of fighting a proxy war essentially mm -hmm. with a nuclear power so we had two two most prominent most powerful nuclear states and most. direct neighborhood of russia it's not in vietnam yeah it's, it's not, not in it's not in cuba potentially it's yeah. in the uh, in the neighborhood, in the former Soviet Union era, uh, in an area which Russia considers an existential, yeah, uh, and the Donbas security yeah. to its whole, you know, uh, idea of self, right? At the end of the day, yeah. So, and it was also a difficult situation for the U.S. because this, uh, because I think it's both an art and, a, and science of managing escalation, uh, was I, I suppose somewhat lost on the U.S. and especially in that you know, high stakes context, context, right? So it had to quickly relearn the lessons. Also taking into account that ultimately, no matter what, the stakes of that conflict are higher for Russia than they ever will be for the United States. And this wasn't something that, that you know, that that US can ex evade, a reality that they cannot evade. This... And that's why maybe they're, they've been trying to contain this conflict in oh, terms yeah. of supply, they do it, you know, with a teaspoon, slowly, gradually, you know, getting the Russians is, accustomed to escalation yeah. by, you know, gradual escalation. So basically, you know, the, the rational thing to do for Russians would be, and they did that many times before, bless you, many yeah, times I'm before. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is usually what a, uh, a, a country that both has a symmetry of stakes on its side. And it's not necessarily conventionally superior to its opposing force, potentially not when we're talking about Ukraine, but when we're talking about, you know, patron state of Ukraine, right, of the West. Mm -hmm. So they basically, they manipulated uncertainty, manipulate know, knowingly and willingly manipulated risk. I mean, on a nuclear level, this is what, you know, strat you know, escalate to de-escalate doctrine essentially is. It's manipulating risk of uncontrollable escalation, right? Manipulating risk that a single use of nuclear weapons or even setting up conditions for its use, you know, losing chain of command or coupling uh, nuclear warheads and delivery mechanisms creates a situation where not everything in the conflict can be controlled, right? And this is, uh, if you go back, this is shelling, essentially. This is uh, a threat that leaves something to chance, uh, you know, competition risk thing and stuff like that. So the US had to tackle that in a way that would, you know, limit uncertainty Mm, prevent horizontal and vertical escalation really at the same time and and yet not create a, a situation where us us's uh, client state essentially suffers significant defeat mm. uh and that's a very difficult situation there was a very interesting article on texas national security review about it recently uh, uh by men by, by uh madam i believe is called her name is stein uh forgive me for it. janice stein i believe but i'm not sure uh where she described how the u.s took an approach of learning by doing uh which is slowly trying to push back the russian red lines const constantly reevaluating re whether yeah they on a daily basis daily basis yeah because remember they, the u.s also had to avoid entrapment by all costs okay yeah because that's that's a good point at the same time they didn't want to be entangled and, and that was priority really because the us had basically two two objectives one 
and that was overarching uh, you know the, the the main objective was not to get drawn into direct conflict with russia which mm. has the potential for drastic and sudden and uncontrollable escalation the second objective was not to allow ukraine to lose not have russia lose this especially not lose it to drastically this war we can go back to why but not to have ukraine lose but again the priority was not getting drawn into this conflict so they did learning by doing they they, they did uh you know essentially what you call the uh, feeding by the you know by a spoon trickle trickle the trickling down yeah fingers yeah, yeah, like which was strong. very i mean the first thing that happened and that was important and again this is from the tnsr uh, article is that the americans set up parameters publicly officially set up the parameters of the things that the us will not do in this war right so they there was that they said there will be no no fly zone there will be no direct there will be no boots on the ground either nato or the us no direct involvement there would be no facilitating ukrainian strikes on russian territory and not providing weapon systems that could allow it and not providing targeting data that would permit targeting top brass of russian military and lastly they said they will not attempt to depose vladimir putin so this is how they shaped the battlefield they, they, they set up the parameters according to which the war will be waged and U.S. support will be waged. And they have not diverted from this up to now, right? There are still no Atacams missile systems, right? They 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 stayed true to their commitments, which again sets up like a base, you know, a baseline of understanding between Washington and Moscow. Right? Yeah, I mean, that, that's why, true. you know, this is limited, a limited war par excellence, but at the same time, in a, in a pivotal one. A critically mm. important one for the balance of power, and and I wonder why the Russians are accepting the the framework, because uh, maybe they th- they thought that at the beginning it would serve them, but then they were you know started losing you know. Sure, sure. And, good question. I mean that, that and, I and, and, and and the pro- the the key point is, and it's still ahead of us, because you know the limited war has two phases. The phase one we have just described that that you are, you know shaping the framework of competition. Another one is persuading the losing party to lose without escalating to another you know level of escalation that mm. would pro- potentially bar bar this party from losing. And in this case, Russia from using nuclear weapons, uh, hybrid warfare elsewhere, how to how to persuade yeah. the losing party to really lose? <laughs> without us changing the escalation level and recognizing how badly it could lose before things go yeah. might go south right and that's and... going to be tricky and that's going to be tricky let alone that here and yesterday i spoke to to people on the ground with ukrainian soldiers in, in zaporozh and in the donbas uh, with the pole you know with the with the people there so and that the ukrainian soldier ukrainian soldiers don't want to accept anything short of the seizure of Crimea and uh, you know uh, taking Donbas mm. and the full victory. So I wonder how the Americans are going to play the ball. Yeah. You know, I I mean, you know, the thing is, the thing is, it's not in the U.S. interest to have that outcome, precisely because this could really, those actions could really rest, you know, touch the red line. And again, I don't believe it is in the U.S. interest to have Russia squarely defeated militarily. In, in a in a you know a, a route for the Ukrainian forces because historically those outcomes usually meant a severe threat to continuity and stability of Russian state itself right you know lost wars yeah, and, in Russia and, and here we need to talk about grand strategy American grand strategy but you know but mm. in full breadth oh. uh, saying that that would trigger three uh, unpleasant consequences for the uh, for America but very pleasant for Ukrainians and Poland yeah, this where is we where the grand this, strategic objectives diverge. We individual. have a split of interest here. So the Americans don't want the Russia to to lose heavily, like in the First World War, because the breakup of Russia will mean that uh, there is chaos on nuclear weaponry and stuff. Second, that the Chinese are getting the resources for free without the need to politically pay and economically pay for them. And three, that uh, Russia, that is not... Uh, governable is uh, self-governable is is is, is losing uh, coalition capability so the united states uh, longer 
term cannot pivot Russians away from China. Uh, so those three reasons are, uh, and of course, the uh, escalation control, fear of uncontrolled escalation that we have discussed at length uh, in this podcast, uh, which I think uh, uh, escapes the attention of many commentators that this is exactly what's going on here. And we need to put it in the perspective that this is already, and this is my thesis, a scalable war, world war between the United States and China that in the thermonuclear age is being started somewhere on the Trump administration with the imposition of tariffs on probably Huawei and ZTE. But, you know, it's debatable just the same way as debatable is when the Second World War started. I mean, the political imbalance that led to kinetic confrontation when it started. Uh, it's disputable whether it was Manjuria invasion, or whether it was uh, Italy invading uh, Ethiopia or uh, Germany annexing Czechoslovakia or Austria or invading physically Poland. You know, it's I mean, in terms of structure, it's difficult to say. Or maybe it was Pearl Harbor for the United States or Barbarossa initiation in June 20, 1941 when it started. So, you know, it's, 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 it's to be debated uh, in a way. But here we have a scalable world war with between the United States and China, where the parties within the civilized framework of competition are highly competing, but without resorting to kinetic exchange and without resorting to thermonuclear weaponry and trying to protect their yeah. core interests so that the social contract doesn't break like this, so that you know there is some sort of a containment of uncontrolled escalation towards full hostilities, which but it happened, by the way, and uh, and uh, war in Ukraine is just a symptom of a great imbalance across Eurasia, in political power and black of, and the lack of accords of how the issues, how the matters of Eurasia. The are consensus broken. is broken. Consensus is broken. The United States cannot be a broker to the peace deals, and the yeah. more unipolar moment is gone. Maybe it will return if the United States wins this war and and another confrontation this time with China or China collapses. It might come back, but it's gone. And 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 now the final court of appeal, the Supreme Court, who decides agencies between the parties, is the military power and coercion and uh, brute force and ability to kill. And uh, in this way, in this way, Putin Putin did succeed. And because I, I felt like. I don't know if we spoke about this before, but I've read uh, his speech in Valdai. Hmm. And you could see that one of his idiosyncrasies, apart from, you know, he, he really shaped the battlefield right prior to war. You know, he could have expected that it's going to go much better. And it wasn't that far from it going much better for Russia. Yeah, that's Again, a sure mm -hmm. Yeah. But I also felt, the reason why I'm mentioning this is I felt that apart from all that and, and logic, there was also his own little idiosyncrasy where... He genuinely, genuinely thought that, you know, he had a problem with the West on a on a ideological, phenomenological level. So I really felt that this rash decision to do it, to to, to go into war, uh, was partly that, not just called rational, you know, calculation or even structural reasons pushing him towards war. Because he wanted to kick the, you know, kick the table over, right? Like break the break the consensus in a way. On a on a uh, symbolic level, he succeeded. This was a symbolic, I think, end of of the unipolar moment. It might have happened before, but this was a very symbolic moment where you could see, well, you know, the truth lays naked, it lays bare in front of it, you. It was especially moment. symbolic and purely and purely, uh, you know, a, a line uh, dividing two eras because the United States openly and explicitly stated that if the invasion happens. Putin and Russia will face consequences. So that was a, a, a real threat, a real sanction hanging in the air by the alleged Supreme Court of the of the world, what we call the unipolar moment superpower. And uh, and it was uh, overruled. I mean, it was, I don't give you, I don't give a can, we can't enforce it on you. That was it. And this, th that signals the scalable world war, and let's hope it's only scalable. Okay, for, uh, by our dear audience and now all connectivities all relationship being trade technology capital supply chains value chains 
that in the globalized world market that occurred you know, over the last 30 years, it all became a playground who is in charge of those relationships. Everything became a, a pitch upon which the game is being played. Who controls the flows? Who controls on what terms he or she buys and sells, produces, works? Who works on whom? And and this is a you know a, is a, it's the highest prize, the highest trophy possible on planet Earth. And this is a, a good enough a reason to really uh, have a competition and a fight. Uh, and uh, you know, coming back to to war in Ukraine. So what is uh, and you know in, in the opening statements in this podcast, Albert and I being Poles, we are uh, perp- on purpose to have been trying to sort of uh, abstain from talking from the Polish perspective here, because Polish perspective is is clear. And let me put it uh, forward: uh, we want Russia to lose and collapse. And we will do our best to deliver that. It doesn't have to be in line with the, the Americans are thinking. And we believe in, in, in the rise of the intermarium and the new balance of power in Europe, where the intermarium, aka common old commonwealth comprising Poland, Belarus, Lithuania, Baltic states, is creating a, a, another pole of power, another pole of balancing, which for the last 200 years was forgotten especially in the western part of our continent. That's why Russia was being flirted and invited by French and Germans. And this war is all about it. And, and, and For us. Yeah, for us. Okay, sure. For us. For us, Paul's talking to you now. And for Ukrainians fighting in the trenches and, and uh, uh, on the Dnieper River. And, yeah. uh, and this, so we have this community of purpose here, us and Ukrainians in that yeah. respect. But again, this is absolutely not the objective for the United States because simply, A, the risks involved are just too large to justify. And B, you know, uh, you know, we can't say for certain or have any indications that this is something that U.S. establishment has as an objective. But again, we have to go back to West Mitchell and sequencing, right? Where the idea was the way to manage the dual competition of Russia and China is to make it impossible for Russia to try to expand further west and become a you know become a part of European security architecture, right? To permanently break the ability of Russia to to project power west and influence west, and, you know, yeah. political power, military power, everything. And with that, and we see this by the way in in the thinkers like Karaganov in Russia, who is a big fan, apart from big fan of using nuclear weapons, as a yeah, as a pre- pre- not a precaution, as an admonition, that as, a, as, a, as a polite reminder of yeah. stakes. But he's also uh, he's also a big fan of Russian, uh, you know, Russian Russia focusing on developing its easternly parts, the, the less mm-hmm. developed parts, the Siberias of the world. And stuff Pivot like to that. Asia. Pivot to Asia. Russian Pivot to, to Asia. Asia. That, and that's a, in general, that's a, as, as far as I remember, it's a you know, significant train of thought. Maybe not appreciated by Kremlin elites, but there is a lot of thinking about this. So again, the idea was that once, fr- from Wes Mitchell's perspective, as I understood it, was once you prevent or make it permanently impossible for Russia to project power west, Russia will have no choice but to focus on, you know, redirecting its its energy in, in improving the living standards and situation in the in the east of the country, where it would run into con- conflict, potential friction, at least, with China. And this is where the U.S. could support Russia with, you know, credits and ra- U.S. and allies uh, opportunities, because there would be no, uh, no immediately colliding interests between U.S. And, and Russia at that point in time, which could, again, help to... Uh, weaken the alliance that's a huge you know very oversimplified view but this is i suppose but the you know the the perfect way to to manage this 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 rivalry but you know clearly to do this you need to have russia as a as a functioning state to engage in this right otherwise all bets are off so again when we in poland again if we speak about what is being felt in the intermarium There is a lot of criticism in Poland and Ukraine about the trickle of of military support from from U.S. coming to Ukraine, that it prevented Ukrainian route, that it made the victory more difficult, if not impossible. But I would be careful leveraging this critique, 
because it could very well be that the US did things exactly right. Actually, because again, their objectives are different to the objectives of Eastern European states. And in that sense, the US has managed this, this war very well and the escalation uh, dynamics very well. Yeah, that's true. And that's this is not something that we want to deal with, I suppose, but it could be. Yeah, a trading. And, and on top of that, also to, to give a praise to, to the United States as a sort of a master, strategic masterpiece and in opposition to our previous episode where we sort of criticized a little bit lack of strategic plan toward uh, vis-a-vis China. In this case, in this case uh, against Russia, they've been really uh, prudent. And I think that the, the basic assumption that allowed them to, to navigate to those waters in this fashion was uh, this realization, this contention that the uh, United States and Eurasia to its allies on both ends of Eurasia tends to be a corner store, cornerstone offshore balancer that provides enough enough gravity for those allies to, to you know, to to rely, to 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 to, to group and create an anti-hegemonic coalition against Russia and against China, and as. In case of Asia, without the United States and its heavy presence in the forward positions, in the first isle of chain, uh, uh, the chain of islands, is a uh, prerequisite for the other allies to group because s- separately they could be dealt with sequently in a sequence by China uh, because China is too powerful. It is very simply to say that it's very simple to say that the United States simply understood that Russia doesn't have this capacity and capability to 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 become such a threat that the United States have have to be present on European Peninsula in numbers for the uh, anti hegemonic coalition to 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 be shaped. It will happen without the United States being present, and it has happened. And it's a very it's a relief for the United States. You know about what I mean. So they don't need to be present heavily in Europe to make it happen. Uh, as the case of Ukraine shows, it will. It's not the case in Asia, and that on one hand relieves the United States of certain duties, creating suspicions among the Eastern flank countries where the United States is fully uh, entangled. At the same time, it, it gives them maneuver. And we simply need to live with this. And if so, then Albert, I think that Poland, if, if we if we understand that this is the case, we should start negotiating with the Americans what I call the uh, pro- protocol of propor- proportionate answer. Because the, uh, uh, the Russians will be in f- trying to enforce by coercion upon Poland and other countries in the region, and without heavy presence of the United States, there will be nobody behind whom we could hide. So we need to answer directly by ourselves, but of course in a proportionate manner, so that there is no global world war, which the United States wouldn't like. So we need to have an understanding with the Americans, what is proportionate in responding, and we need to sign it, some, some sort of protocol, so that because otherwise our modernization our military reform doesn't make sense i mean so what is the purpose of this reform if we can't use it you know mm-hmm. and as a political leverage what is the per- if, if it's still american americans controlling it this way or another what is Look, it? But this is a problem also i know we spoke about this but think about this it's a it's a problem insofar as we essentially i mean that's already the case quite frankly but we openly cede part of escalation control to the US. And remember, once this becomes clear, this could also be easily exploited, well, not easily, but it could be exploited by adversary, right? Knowing that, because what you're basically saying is, uh, and again, there are two problems. So this is the first problem, because this is what it means. It, it uh, Americans still control escalation over here. It's very clear. In the same way that they control it in Ukraine, there was a Newsweek article about how CIA managed escalation mm-hmm. in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. As, as strongly as it could and as decisively as it could so they still do that but to give it openly and to also provide a catalog of situation it really creates uh, a, a, an outlet for potential adversary to get into nukes and crannies and manipulate that protocol and remember that 
I, I do believe that even though, you know, the case between Ukraine and Poland, cases between Ukraine and Poland are different, Poland is a treaty ally, nonetheless, the fear of entrapment by the US into a land war in Europe is significant. They were, and that's why the U.S. will want to retain as much escalation control so, over the situation. So you think that both the United States and also Poland, but for completely different uh, other reasons, will tr- will will stick to the uh, strategy of ambiguity in that respect, whether we respond on our own or we are being controlled by the United States, so that the Russians don't know who is in charge of responding. If, for example, Look, that's a good, that's a great question because, and I really don't know. You remember when you pointed out that, you know, why did you ask me the question and, you know, gracefully you did it to push me on the answer. Why did Russians didn't do anything? Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know. And it's impossible to know. At I the feel beginning like of the war, why they didn't impossible. react uh, expandingly? Yeah. We don't know. We don't know how deterrence works, really. Where it works, where it doesn't, for what reasons does it fail? We really don't know. Yeah. It also touches on cultural aspects, yeah, Beha- behavioral oh, yeah. aspects oh, yeah. also. Of but it's, mm-hmm. look, crisis, crisis long dead and gone, Berlin crisis. We don't fully know how it happened. We don't really know the mechanism in which deterrence yeah. worked, or was it even... Or was it even not deterrence, but internal political reasons or something like this? Or they never intended to, you know, do anything? We don't know. So it's a, and that's a huge question when it comes to Russia, not attacking supply lines, you know, not doing anything. Very precisely walking around. And this also shows that ultimately Russia is bluffing, but it's obvious that Russia is bluffing. Nobody playing the game of chicken is really wanting to die, right? People who have this sort of mentality never make it to positions of power in the first place. So it's obvious that it's a bluff. But you saw you saw this thing a couple of days back when Russians attacked a port on uh, border mm-hmm. strict borderline between Romania and and Ukraine, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but they still what again? This was clear signaling, but they were still careful to signal just right and not hit you know accidentally the other side of the river, right? They didn't do that, and it's clearly a message. So look. I don't know. We have a big problem. We have a huge, really, quite frankly, effing problem with escalation management right now vis-a-vis Belarus. A huge one. And this is why I do believe you were talking about the the short list of, you know, escalation management, right? Or- yeah, I mean, sort of, I call it protocol of propor- proportions or proportionalism yeah. or yeah. You proportionality. Know, yeah. Proportionality. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, again, maybe provide our foreign audience with a bit of a context we 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 find ourselves in a ourselves in a very peculiar situation right now because wagner group elements at least have by now moved to belarus and are engaged in both training belarusian military as well as military exercises on the countries on belarus's western western borders which of course are all borders with poland and lithuania and it's a huge problem. We had a uh, very, I mean, I found them amusing, uh, not because I don't consider it a reality. They were just amusing in the way Lukashenko delivers it, but threats that Wagner might engage in asymmetric operations, hybrid operations in Poland. In other words, that they might come, cross over and do some stuff and have some fun over here. Um, so that's a very risky situation. The Polish government seems to be very concerned about this. Just today, we we're recording this on the 29th of July, we had Prime Minister Morawiecki pointing out that Poland suspects and kind of even expects that Belarusian, uh, that Wagner Group troops, mercenaries will engage in operations in the Polish territory. Um, that's what he said today, yes? Yes, that's what he said today. So that's a very concerning messaging. And again, I personally don't think Polish stakeholders are known to manipulate this sort of stuff, you know, it's not in uh, not uh, uh, not their modus operandi to do those things. So I do believe when Morawiecki says that he's not trying to uh, prod the Americans to do something. I think he says it because he's concerned that this could be really the case. We had, I just wanted to point out, we had incursions of Belarusian Special Operations Forces uh, Spetsnaz into Polish territory a couple of times. This uh, was reported in Polish media by very repu- repu- reputable, trusted sources. Uh, that basically we had Belarusian spots, Spetsnaz operating in Poland, crossing the border. Uh, and again, with Wagner, of course, the main benefit is that you have, you know, uh, plausible denial, denial ability. So it's a very dangerous situation. I'm not sure if we're on a, uh, if Polish 
government is fully prepared to react quickly. Also because we see that the thinking of escalation, really, pardon me, but I get <laughs> thinking of escalation to the Americans. We saw this, for example, in Przewodów, right? When the Ukrainian... Yeah, then just to, to cut long story short, so far, the, gov- the Polish government has been uh, 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 sticking, you know, quite uh, f- fully to the American uh, definition of uh, escalation control and uh, to the uh, sort of yeah. the, uh, you know, American control over that. So we were a loyal NATO member in terms of... Uh, cutting short our ambition to really expand the war because our... We don't attempt to entrap Americans, essentially. Exactly. So, but here the story is a bit different. We we might have some sort of a terrorist terrorist like uh, activity, raids or other atrocities or coercion or... or We can have kidnappings. We can have, have, you know, direct... The the question is, we need to react without waiting for the Americans. That's why we need this protocol of proportionality. Mm -hmm. Because uh, also it's also in the American interest to have this protocol because they can't react to anything happening because sometimes it's useful for them to use proxies to contain war in the low local level without um, uh, re- resorting yeah. to NATO and Article 5, 5 and so on. So, and I think that our political elites, our decision-making processes and also capa- military capabilities should uh, should get ready, should be Sure. Operationalized to 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 react, and also we should think about preemptive action uh, once they cross doing something. Without you know, I mean, what is bre- yeah. what breaks of law means? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what is the definition of intrusion? What uh, kind of uh, in- sure. internal personality we have? Whether we can kill guys just raiding on BTRs in Poland because they are, they are rumored to be soldiers. Or what? Yeah, being mercenaries without uh, national emblems, because the Russians for for sure will exploit this privilege of the ability that it's not us; it's a green little yeah. man of unknown origin. Yeah, Volodya got drunk and he went over the border. But what are we gonna do? Yeah, definitely the thing, Yatsik. And this is where the problem really begins. And this is the problem that we will have in uh, in convincing or in arguing to the Americans that we should be allowed this uh, protocol of yours is that we find ourselves in a very peculiar situation right now. On the, on the one hand, there is Wagner Group in Belarus. There was a car- capable troops that saw combat, and that's priceless. None of Polish, or very few of Polish troops by now have saw combat. And not at the did. scale. And not at the scale. And not on the, at the yeah. scale, not in the modern modern war kind the of part. Intensity and so on. So that's a problem number one. Problem number two, and this is which might point us to at least asking a question how <clears throat> how Prigozhin's coup, or Prigozhin's mutiny, really more than coup, was unplanned. Because we find that all of a sudden, in two moves, basically, we find ourselves in a situation where there's Wagner and Belarus on the one hand, but on the other, we have reasons to believe that there is Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus as well. An mm-hmm. unknown way in which this nuclear sharing happens. So the way battlefield, so to speak, has been shaped, is that by the Russians and they essentially are... has an offensive capability to escalate, to manage escalation, or to, to, to control mm-hmm. escalation, really, on the one hand, vis-a-vis Poland. And they have a backstop if Poland would like to respond. Whether we're talking about, you know, active defense in a major way, which again, we must think if there is a risk of war with Belarus, we have to do active defense, preemptive strikes against Grodno, right? This isn't something that we can escape. You told me that a million times. Uh, And I think you're right. But even smaller ones, there's going to be a big problem of responding because Americans, and again, we go back to Ukraine and how, you know, learning by doing and small steps and avoiding uncontrollable escalation. Americans will be very leery of being, being, you know, tangled in a conflict, yeah. which has the potential to escalate to nuclear weapons use. It's, to, to it's, if we, and this is if a reality. We attack even by accident some depots with nuclear warheads, or, you know, or maybe the Americans will be suspecting us of attacking them on purpose, just to eliminate them and to, mm-hmm. sh- to show, to demonstrate our capability to the Russians to become an independent player in the vis-a-vis escalation uh, duel. Yeah. Oh, sure. Why the Russians and Americans don't want us to be peer partners in escalation duel? Well. That's a that's a you know stories of truth. which is perfectly but, reasonable. You know, what, what I mean, they... from their side, but of course, their side, the ambitions yeah. to con- to control our buffer zones in the east and what's going on yeah. there. 
and what sort of threat is emanating from from there. So it's always you know the zero sum game a bit, even within the yeah. alliance, NATO alliance. It's an, it's a fully understandable you know like Turkey moving around and looking around its neighborhood, mm. right? That's that's you know that was uh, yeah. at one point it was inevitable for Turkey to to embark on it. Mm. But this is again this is sure. But this you know so we find ourselves in a situation right where Russians are in prime position to mess around and they have a backstop against us messing back with them back. And this is just the hard reality of it. And 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 and, and that sets our active defense strategy. That might maybe we have been contemplating for sure at strategy and future. We've been proposing it, uh, Albert and I and other guys from our team. But uh, our politicians from time to time were just signaling that they maybe they sort of understand this concept, and uh, and that might set this uh, active defense. Uh, uh, strategy futile. I mean, not futile, but potentially futile. I mean, made futile by the American intervention to stop doing anything uh, like that on our on Polish part. Yeah, yeah. If, if I'm clear what I'm saying, uh, so so maybe as you see, uh, if our dear audience could see that war in Ukraine itself uh, has repercussions across the region. The balance of power has been uh, is being shaped also by all events happening by by uh, assessment of actions of other partners, our partners, coalitions, uh, hybrid, regular peer symmetry and asymmetry. All those factors that suddenly we need to take into account. And this is a new era, new reality, and, and the first campaign of the scalable world war. And this is how we see those things. A strategy in future, and that's a good moment to to end our podcast uh, today. Uh, looking forward to to reconnecting with our audience uh, in another one. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Ed. and you stay with us at Strategy in Future and join us on our YouTube channel. Almost two hundred thousand subscribers already have. It's your turn now if you haven't, and uh, it's very much welcome. And we will be. T- we will keep talking about events worldwide occurring, especially in Eurasia, uh, that are all really great importance. Thank you very much. Stay with us.